All right, we are on chapter two, and it is called Mouse Minor at School. Twice, easily twice, that pocket with the smart gold thread crest got ripped off in fights at school. The first time in a tussle with Trevor, the son of the mouse comptroller of stores, he was overgrown, was Trevor, easily three times my size. Who do you think you are, you miserable? Little mouse, you noxious nobody. Trevor's sneers drew a crowd. One day I shall be mouse comptroller of stores. My father cannot live forever. And what will you be, I should like to know? A seamstress? Trevor's face was in mine, and all around us the crowd of scholars exclaimed, Ha ha, well said, Trevor, jolly good, that's telling him, etc. Noxious nobody indeed. I was, of course, not going to put up with that kind of talk, not even from one who was virtually rat-sized. I looked far up at hulking Trevor, propped my spindly fists on my hips, and squeaked, Listen, you great nincompoop, your father, the so-called mouse controller of stores, is a well-known crook and a thief in the night. He's selling palace cheese on the side and pocketing the profit. I don't know where I got my information. But the gathered crowd was interested. Trevor's eyes narrowed and reddened. As for your mother. Those were my last words in this first run-in with Trevor. He fell on me, and the day went dark. When I was conscious again, the crest on my uniform hung from a thread, and one of my eyes was far bigger than the other one. Then when I went around a fisticuffs with Fitzherbert, son of the mouse permanent superintendent of the muse. He ripped off my pocket and loosened one of my teeth, one of the two front ones, naturally one of my best teeth. He was easily four times my size, was Fitzherbert, and smelled of drains. When I pointed this out to him and remarked that he could be smelled from the far end of the muse when the wind was right, he pinned me to the floor. He was all over me, and the smell was staggering. Now he was speaking moistly into my free ear. His knee was in my back. You do not know your place, Mouse Miner, you unpleasant morsel of cat meat. Mere nephews ought not be allowed. Never nephews. And once again, the day went dark. From the first morning of my schooling to the last afternoon, I mixed it up with the, with the sons of all the best families in the mews. All the mice of merit, all the rodents of rank, one or the other of my eyes was black most of the time. Both my ears got notched. I was quick with my fists and a little undersized and nobody's child. And I spoke before I thought. It didn't help that I had a better looking uniform than theirs. All right, here's a picture. This is Mouse Miner, the one that the story's about, the mouse with the question mark tail. And these are the other kids beating up on him. With a heavy heart and a packed lunch, somebody was sure to steal. I slumped each morning through the tunnel to school, dragging my question mark tail. I was stuffed into my uniform. Underground and within the walls and in the dark of night, we're often dressed. It's only where humans might see that we're all fur and four-legged. The less humans know, the better. Time crept like a snail. The days limped by. Aunt Marigold had to let out my uniform, then make me a bigger one than a bigger one still. But I was really quite a runt unto the sudden end of my school days. I rarely met anybody on those sad underground journeys through the tunnel to school every blasted morning. Apart from the occasional slimy slug leaving its silvery trail behind it, and once or twice a furry caterpillar. Twice, actually. The Royal Muse Mouse Academy kept in an airless burrow under the writing school for the human children of the royals up in the palace. We scholars sat below the thump of pony hoofs, occasionally pulling each other's tails through the long school days. Posture counted. We had to sit up straight on our haunches, which gave me a crick in the back and a pain in the neck. Our seats were alphabet blocks that had vanished from royal nurseries far above. Our desks were foot-long rulers. We learned our letters by looking under each other, and we learned our numbers from the rulers. And, of course, mice are famous for our multiplication. Our ancient headmaster was peculiar even for a teacher. Not a fine figure, either. 
He crouched on a platform before us with his silk robe black as night wrapped tight around him. He had a nasty habit of swabbing out his ears with his thumb. His fingers were like the spindly spokes of a miniature umbrella. When he pointed one of those dismal digits at you, you shrank and drooped. I did. Even his teeth were worrying, and you saw them when he sneered. Not big teeth at the front in the normal way, but a lot of teeth crowding his mouth. Very worrying. Worse, he had it in for me for the first day. No question about it. I felt his old, dim, ruby eyes boring into me through the smoked lenses of his spectacles. In my opinion, you're either English or you're not. We took him for a foreigner. The nameplate on his desk read, B. Chiroptera, and following that in flourishing letters, M. A. This stood for Master of Arts. I don't know about that, but he was certainly Master of the Toothpick, as my knuckles proved. Just let my mind wander for a second, and wham! went the toothpick in old B. Chiscop B. Chiroptera's webby hand down on my knuckles with a painful thwack. Yes, mice have knuckles, and mine were swollen. <clears throat> my ears scalloped, my eyes mismatching, my knuckles raisins. Would it ever end? I'll say this for him, old Chiroptera. He knew his history backward and forward. And of course, human affairs have always been entirely dependent upon mice. For old Chiroptera, history was always the worst of times, never the best. Even in his reedy, cheeping voice like a rusty hinge, he had us on the edge of our alphabet blocks with his lecture on Mice of the French Revolution. It wasn't just human heads that rolled. Never think it. Down came the razor blade of many a miniature guillotine. Chop! Mice necks are not easy to find, but the guillotine found them. Many a mouse head suddenly separated, dropped into the fatal basket, whiskers still twitching, or went rolling across the slick cobblestones of Paris, several heads, sightless eyes seeming to stare, three blind mice, and then some more. In all his lessons, old Chiroptera was on the side of the aristocrats and royalty, but this did not stop the chop of the guillotine in his tales. Boys like blood, but even Fitzherbert and Trevor were scared witless, though they were twice the headmaster's size. And while he must have been foreign, he seems to have swallowed the English dictionary. You never heard so many unnecessary words in your life. Unaccustomed as I am, he often cheeped, to scholars as pusillanimous, unprepossessing, even preposterous as you lot, I can only hope to insinuate some nuggets of knowledge into the minuscule cavities between your heedless ears. Oh, it was a grim place altogether, was the Royal Muse Mouse Academy. I can't tell you. Almost preposterously awful. Behind old B. Chiroptera at the front of the borough hung a portrait of Her Majesty Queen Victoria. It had been gnawed out of a picture postcard and hung in a place of prominence. Over it was draped a banner to proclaim her diamond jubilee, sixty years upon the throne. I hadn't imagined her <clears throat> like her picture. I'd thought she'd be wearing a crown and floating on a cloud. Something like that. I thought she might be eating cheese. We squeaked the school song and chorus every morning to start the day. Most of our voices had changed, though few for the better. Beneath the hooves, within the walls, we lurk prepared when duty calls. We are not moles, we are not voles, and thankfully there are no trolls. We're mice who labor all unseen. We're mice in service to the queen. God save the queen and all her relations, and keep us meek in our proper stations. Then three half-hearted hurrahs and a weary cheer, and we fell to our studies and pulling each other's tail. All the while, this old human lady stared down at us from her picture. Her eyes and their saggy sockets seemed to follow me. I did not care for school, but sore knuckles will cure a wandering mind. I learned my letters and how to string words together. Look at this page. And I learned my numbers up to 12, as far as the ruler went. We had to know the whole history of Queen Victoria, too. Her entire family tree, all the way back to the roots, all the way down to the twigs. I learned everything, except who I was. But friends? No. 
There I sat, dreary day in and dreary day out, fidgeting at the end of my ruler at the number 12 mark with nobody wanting to sit next to me at 11. The eyes of old Queen Victoria seemed to find me even there. She was the greatest queen in human history and all-powerful. Also, very sharp-eyed for a human. Maybe she was all-knowing, too. Maybe she knew who I was. That, no <clears throat> that notion took root there in the minuscule cavity between my notched ears, and there that notion grew and grew as the Queen's Jubilee grew nearer and nearer. And that is the end of chapter two.